My name is Aisha Huck and I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I have the pleasure this afternoon of introducing today's keynote, Dr. Jeff Preston. Before I do that, I wanna take a moment and respectfully acknowledge the land on which we're privileged to gather. I know we're joining virtually today, but I wanna acknowledge that the land I'm joining this webinar on uh, from and on which Western University is situated is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenotewak, and Chinooktik nations. On lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Long before settlers renamed this place London after the Thames River in England, the Deshkon Zidi, or the Antler River as the Anishinaabe know it, was a tributary channel and home for the indigenous nations who continue to be the original peoples to this place. Yesterday I spoke about the problematic role that education has played in the settler colonial project, um, but also of the potential of education to break these cycles of oppression. So today, as we engage in conversation with Dr. Jeff Preston about how our classrooms structurally disable students, I think we have opportunities to reflect on how we, as educators, can actively dismantle these structures of oppression. Before we get going this uh, afternoon, I have two quick comments about logistics, just like yesterday. Uh, this keynote is being recorded and it will be available to you on the CTL website in approximately two to three weeks. The session ends at 2.15 and we will have time for questions. Uh, so during the keynote and right after Dr. Preston's talk, please use the Q&A feature to enter in your questions. And you'll see that chat is also enabled for our conversation today. So I'm hoping to engage with you there as well. Dr. Jeff Preston is an assistant professor of disability studies at King's University College at Western, where he teaches classes on disability, popular culture, and policy. A longtime advocate and motivational speaker, Jeff's work focuses on the intersection of disability, subjectivity, biopower, and culture. Jeff's first book, The Fantasy of Disability, was published in 2016 by Routledge. I'm so delighted to have him here today. So without further delay, I'm going to turn things over to you, Jeff. All right, thank you, Aisha. It's, it's so good to be here. Uh, I am going to steal your screens uh, because even though we are in, in COVID times and in the webinar world, uh, it only seems fitting uh, that you die by PowerPoint uh, yet another time. Um, before I begin uh, the presentation, uh, I want to note that I'm intersection of medical science and white supremacy in Canada, and the ways in which it rationalizes eugenic discipline or elimination of eugenic uh, Indigenous people through pseudoscientific pathologization of BIPOC minds and bodies. We must not just acknowledge but resolve the disabling outcomes of colonialist systems, be it the lack of potable water or the destruction of families and culture, or the corporeal and psychological carnage of state and police violence. As settlers on these lands, I must continue to acknowledge the ways that I have benefited from the past and present and continuing colonial project of Canada, the ways that I encounter ableism are from a position of privilege, and that we must see disability justice as being inextricably bound to truth and to reconciliation. So on our first slide here today, we have a macro photo of a pencil sitting atop a line graph with undulated lines spiking from negative numbers to over a hundred. The title of this talk highlighted in yellow is Popper's Prognosis and Paper with the subtitle Reflecting on Past, Present and Future of Disability in Canadian Classrooms. At the bottom of the slide, uh, we have my contact information. Uh, you can find me on most social media sites as at Jeff Preston. Uh, if you were born in the 1980s like me, uh, you can also email me at jeff.preston at ew.ca. Uh, or if you like web blogs that are often ignored, you can find me online at jeffpreston.ca. 
But you might be wondering, well, who is this person before you? Uh, well, I am a youngish, ish, youngish, Caucasian male with wavy brown hair. Uh, I'm wearing a short sleeve gray blue button up dress shirt with a knitted gray tie, uh, not on brand for Kings, but uh, still a nice tie nonetheless. Uh, my journey into the world of education in London began in 2002 when I first arrived at Western uh, to do an undergraduate in media information and technoculture in the Faculty of Media and Information uh, Studies. Uh, from there, after graduating in 2014, I went on and taught for several years at Fanshawe College in digital marketing. And as of 2017, I arrived back at Keeley's University College in the Disability Studies program, which, as you'll see from the slide, uh, not everyone agrees is such a good thing. Uh, this is a, a highlighted uh, tweet. Uh, somebody replied to me, someone who uh, is a horse paced enthusiast, uh, who said that JJ Preston phony professor, fake doctor, is proof Western U King's College doesn't hire the best and brightest uh, horse puppy. Uh, so uh, as it was noted, uh, my work is really centered on the intersection of disability and media. Uh, I'm very interested in the ways in which cultural constructions of disability present themselves in popular culture uh, and some of the feedback loop and that the ways that we tell stories about disability then inform the ways in which we interact or act upon people with disabilities in the so-called meat space. So where are we going to be going today? Well, I present uh, my agenda, a meandering pathway uh, with an image of four notebooks uh, stacked haphazardly uh, to give the appearance of the serious work uh, that is about to unfold before you. A question that I'm often asked is, what is it like to have a disability? People seem to have this idea that disability is this completely foreign or otherwise unimaginable thing that they need to find and ask disabled people what it's like because it simply defies the limits of our imagination. Or perhaps it's something that we would just rather not imagine at all. As psychoanalyst Julia Kristeva has quipped, quote, disability inflicts a threat of physical and psychical death, fear of collapse and beyond that, the anxiety of seeing the very borders of the human species explode. And so the disabled person is inevitably exposed to a discrimination that cannot be shared. I wonder though, if discrimination faced by disabled people is truly unshareable. Is it perhaps instead just complicated by the positions from which we most often gaze upon disabled existences? My objective then today is to not resolve the wounded normate uh, psyche, but rather to playfully invert Chris Davis' claim and attempt to share the unshareable. I hope over the next 50 or so minutes to situate some of the discriminatory structures of education within the broader project of Western white able-bodied supremacy, tracking the ways of hegemonic imperatives of normalcy, ideologies largely in the service of neoliberal capitalism have informed the instinctive and often oppressive ways that we respond to disability within our classroom. We're going to start then by looking at three important historic ideologies that echo forward to the present day. I'm then going to pivot to consider some of my own confrontations with these ideologies in school, narrating some of my own experiences, not as exemplar, but as deeply felt truth that shapes my own pedagogy. I share not to shame or guilt, but to situate and to motivate. Not to tell an inspirational story of one man's struggle, but to fantasize about a world where academic success for disabled students is drained of inspiration because it becomes an everyday occurrence. I share not as the most important or the most common experience, but as one of countless stories of people who have swam against the currents of ableism and with a bit of luck and a ton of support have managed to climb down from the back of the classroom to sit behind the lectern at the front. I wanna start then with dispatches from the before times. Our slide features a cropped image of Thomas Rowlandson's 1806 painting, A Select Vestry, featuring who I assume would be wealthy white men enjoying a feast at a dinner table in the vestry room while a poor and emaciated family begs for help at the door. 
A dandy greets them with a boot and a cane, pushing them back to the door labeled workhouse as the excess of food and drink must not be shared. I start with this historic image because when I was in school and elementary school and in high school, I loved history classes. I love to learn about where we came from because I felt that if we knew where we had been, we could chart a better way forward. Hearing teachers and professors talk about the past served to validate those experiences. For me, it made real or tangible things that I hadn't experienced myself. It indicated what parts of human history were important or noteworthy, things that, quote, changed everything for better or worse, and how different people fit within the broader narrative of humanity. But rarely did I hear stories or histories of people like me. In high school history, I didn't learn about life with disability in ancient Egypt or during the European Renaissance. Surely there were disabled people during these times, and of course they were doing interesting things, but I didn't have direct access to that past. I'm not a historian by training, even though I do have a small secret crush on the discipline. But I do still think, all these years later, that sometimes the best way to look forward is to first look back. So I want to start the presentation today by briefly looking at three significant movements in disability and thinking about how these logics of those moments echo forward. My intention here is to think really critically about these, to present here not a complete history of disabled people, should such a beautiful project even be possible, but to talk and point to three issues that I believe that we need to spend more time talking about, thinking about, and working against in our current day pedagogical practice. We start way back when, beginning with a painting by El Greco titled Christ Healing the Blind, depicting a robed Christ in a public square, embracing a crouched blind man, curing his affliction by touching his eyes. The idea of Christ as a healer is iconic, but if we go back a little bit further into the Old Testament, disability is not seen as a good thing, but rather as emblematic of sin or ignorance. Disability manifests itself as a punishment for impropriety, a physical manifestation of impurity or transgression. Disabled people were seen as being unable to hear the good word and therefore outside the knowledge of the church. Aristotle famously said that deaf or mute people were unable to reason and therefore are perhaps not people at all. Disability and evil becomes tied together as being a necessary or obvious punishment, destroying the body for a soul that's already been destroyed. This changes a little bit with Christ though, and as Christ heals the disabled, cares for everyone, Disability and disabled people shift in their usage. Rather than being something as a threat, disabled people now become gateways to heaven. People are implored to care for the disabled people as an act of charity, as an embodiment of their piety. This idea of caring for the less fortunate as it being an important or an urgent need for people to do carries forward all the way up to um, you know, the times of Elizabethan England when a real problem was starting to brew. The number of people requiring support who were in need far outstripped the capacities of the church. And so lo and behold, we of course have our famous Elizabethan poor laws um, of the 1600s. Central to these laws or most important for our story though is that there was a need to determine who is and isn't deserving of charitable support. The idea that some were valid need and some were not. Concerns about fakers or cheats, bad actors that would take advantage of the system, required a categorizing of people, a breaking down of categories. And in the poor laws that we saw then, all the way up now to the current welfare system here in Canada, we tend to see these three structures or these three categories of those who are in need, some of which are seen as valid recipients of care and those who aren't. For disabled people like myself, we would have been referred to as the impotent poor, those who were unable to work, that were, quote, lame or impotent, old and blind. And because we were seen as unable to fend for ourselves, this group of people were seen as deserving of charity, unlike those who were able to work, but simply chose not to, and then were fall into the world of criminalization 
and risk imprisonment. Most importantly, though, I think from this thread of disability history is the ways in which disability is often seen as a tragic event, a tragic event that is in need of restitution. That disabled people start to embody the sick role uh, from our old friend Parsons, the idea that disabled people are excused from society, they are unable to enter into the normative world and therefore must be cared for by the normals. At the same time, we have this urgent need to deserve, to determine who is deserving and who is not of charity and who can perform the charitable role properly. This is a pressure that I have felt most of my life, not just because as a child, I was a literal poster boy for Muscular Dystrophy Canada. Um, my job was to raise money to try and help people like me. But behaving and performing the disabled role was a pressure that I felt not just in front of the camera, but in everyday life. Because people accepting me, liking me, and seeing me as being a valid recipient of charity was central and critical for my survival. I'll never forget when I was younger, I would have been in high school at this point, and uh, those of you who know me will know that I have a little bit of a potty mouth. Uh, I like my swear words quite a bit. And I was already swearing uh, in high school. Uh, my parents did not like that very much. And I'll never forget my mom sitting me down one day and scolding me about this and scolding me about the ways that I was talking in public and saying that people are watching, people are paying attention and are paying attention to the things that you do. That if people reject you, if people see you as no longer being a worthy recipient of charity, we wouldn't be able to afford the types of equipment that is being covered by non-governmental charities, that we wouldn't be able to afford the things that I would need to move on to be independent. I had to learn how to be charming, how to be charismatic, because survival was tied to be behaving the right way, to ensuring that people liked me, that they were comfortable with me, that they saw me as deserving of the care that they were going to bestow. That's a lot of pressure to put on someone. But it also makes us wonder then about the people who don't fit into these boxes that maybe don't have the types of privilege that I have enjoyed. This is our first movement. Our second, we turn to our old friend, the world of eugenics. On the slide, uh, this is a cropped image of a certificate of appreciation from the Second International Congress of Eugenics uh, in 1921, uh, featuring a tree with various inscriptions, including eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution, and a slightly obscured addendum uh, that says, like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. The roots feeding our eugenic tree then are traditional sciences, such as anatomy, physiology, psychology, but also the humanities and social sciences, things like law, sociology, and education. As famously studied in Foucault's work on liberalism toward the end of the 18th century into the 19th century, we refocus our gaze then to life itself and trying to map its limits. Biopower then is born out of the study of population data, census data, birth rates versus death rates, reproduction rates, fertility, all of this could be seen as the cause to certain economic or political issues. Disability then is a deviance from the norm, in need of both investigation, but also a dangerous threat of contamination. As the medical world was exploring human bodies and conditions, Charles Darwin was also exploring the plant and animal world, proposing his evolutionary theory. The idea here is that biological organisms are constantly experiencing mutations, changing within their bodily or mental structures, spurred on by the competition to survive, increasing competitive environments. This led to an explosion of research around the family tree and attempts, of course, to discover animals and their evolutionary roots. The human body, perhaps inspired by industry and technical revolutions of the 18th century then, becomes another machine, though, to be constructed and perfected. Although perhaps most horrifically conceived by Hitler's Übermensch, countries around the world became keenly focused on strength, on perfecting the gene pool. 
The human body, through things like the Human Genome Project, becomes broken down into composite parts, a collection of genes and proteins open to modification or elimination. But how can we know what is normal and good versus what is abnormal or in need of elimination? One source, as outlined by Leonard Davis, was statistics and the concept of the statistical normal. Francis Galton, of course, maps out the statistic norm intent on visualizing or representing the good at the height and the bad at the bottom. We use stats to categorize people, claiming empirical science to provide moral blame. Of course, the problem is that stats do not always reflect the natural or empirical reality as we like to believe it. Consider the lauded IQ test. Does this actually test reveal cognitive function, or is it merely one's knowledge or competency in the regional culture? Put another way, should we be surprised when non-English or non-French fluid speakers score poorly on a test predicated on reading and writing in a specific language? Despite the flaws of IQ tests and the ways that it disproportionately disadvantages uh, BIPOC and neurodiverse people, it continues to be a key benchmark in determining who is and is not valid. We talk a lot about eugenics and this idea of good bodies versus bad bodies as being an old thing. We like to push it back into the 1940s, but eugenics is of course alive and well in the modern world. We here in Canada just very recently passed Bill C-7, which opens up medical assistance in dying for disabled people. Despite protests from disabled actors and advocates in our country, we are now seeing countless news stories of people who are choosing euthanasia, not because of bodily suffering, but because of the limits of the system wrapped around them. Inability to access housing or inability to access medical care that is needed to remunerate or to resolve the pain and suffering of disability these people with little choice. So while we may not be state-run executioners, we are certainly putting the choice into the hands of people and providing them very little other options to consider. This idea, though, of weeding out the good from the bad continues today. The last step that I want to look at is care and discipline and the ways in which we believe the urgent need to discipline disabled bodies. This, I think, is a merging of the eugenic and charity traditions. We see disabled people as deserving of some sort of care, but we also see them as deviant or a threat to the non-disabled population. We think we should provide them medical care, yes, attempt to make them whole or normal again, but we also wish to keep them at arm's length, under the watchful eye of experts who know best. There are countless stories in Canada and abroad of parents being told by doctors that their disabled child will suffer if they remain at home, that parents cannot possibly care, cannot possibly provide the level of care necessary for a disabled child, and the best choice is to remove them from the home and place them within the institution. At the same time, institutions were seen as providing a simple solution to the question of accessibility, why make the entire world accessible if we can just make one building accessible and place disabled people there? With the rise of institutions then, disabled people are pulled out of public life and become ensnared in systems of discipline, held in homes that are intended to give them, quote, the best care while not actually investing in anywhere near the level of care needed. We do not see then public spaces as being one needed to be inhabited by disabled people because they have their own places, places where they are better off. Institutions like Heronia on the screen today have been open for many years, in fact, closing in the 2000s. Many remain open to this day. Greeting us on this slide is a black and white image of an enormous building sitting atop a hill surrounded by green space. This idyllic scene is an image of the infamous Heronia, uh, Heronia Regional Center in Aurelia. And a link here is actually provided to a new documentary that has come out that tries to chart the center's rampant physical, psychological, and sexual abuses, the ways in which disabled people were essentially locked up, in the words of Madeleine Burkhardt. 
But the impulses, the impulses of care and discipline are not just felt within the institution itself. I want to share a brief story about which I time when I was in school. When I was in elementary school, uh, I, was, I was facing some bullying, a uh, very common thing, I think, for many students, unfortunately. Uh, but there were two boys in particular that were picking on me quite a bit, and things had started to escalate. They escalated to the point that my parents and the other children's parents were brought together at the school for a conversation. And it was at this time that the bully's parents explained to my parents and to the teacher that their children couldn't be blamed because, frankly, they were afraid of me, that the wheelchair scared them, and they didn't know how to handle those types of emotions. They didn't know how to handle that fear. And so perhaps it would just be better if we just separated them, if they had their own classroom and maybe I was put in a different class itself. Here, I was not marked as a physical threat, but as a symbolic one. My very presence was upsetting. It needed to be contained. I needed to change or to hide in order to protect them, the normal student. These may seem like old things, things that happened a long time ago, but there are ideologies, threads that continue to carry forward. I want us to consider then how they feed into our current classrooms and the ways in which we expect to graft accessibility onto existing structures. I think one of the ways to think about disability in the classroom right now uh, is on the screen ourselves, our image here of a orange uh, paper crane origami bird floating on the water amongst many others of a different color. I think this is really, it speaks to me because I remember in school the first time we read the story of the ugly duckling. And I remember having that moment of realization that as everyone else in the classroom was thinking, oh, we are the ducklings. We are the ones who are being taught to be nicer. I had that sudden realization that maybe I was the ugly duckling all along. I think that this image represents a core belief of the way that we try to incorporate disability in the classroom right now, which is namely that we imagine disability in the classroom today as an isolated, as a singular, quote, special need that needs to be supported, perhaps charitably, but only on certain conditions. Our first condition comes to us from what we like to call in disability studies, the medical model. This slide includes a stock image of the classic medical scene, uh, a table with clipboard and pen, a stethoscope draped over it, and what appears to be some sort of medical equipment just out of focus in the background. The medical gaze then, as formulated by Michel Foucault in his text, The Birth of the Clinic, talks about the ways in which medical authority ascends, that doctors are seen as experts, protectors of sacred knowledge, and how the eyes of power change those that they look at. People are turned into patients, patients are turned into diagnoses, their futures turned into prognosis, human form and function converted to pathology. The disabled then, dysfunctional, non-conforming bodies then fall under the watchful eye of the all-powerful doctor. They subject disability, forcing it to exist within the confines of the medical world, or trying to help people return to a stated normalcy, or as Robert McGrewer would call it, compulsory able-bodiedness. This idea that normal is defined as able-bodiedness, even though this status is something that almost no one will ever actually embody. Who of the 120 people watching today can say that they are fully able-bodied in mind, body, and spirit? How many of you can say that you will maintain that capacity? Disabled people then are figured as those who have fallen from grace, who have experienced a tragic loss to no longer be able-bodied and therefore no longer normal. Medicine then becomes the lens through which we see disability, and support becomes intimately tied to the label. What one can be expected to do, what one cannot do. The label legitimizes a person's need. From a young age, I was given a label. At three months old, I was diagnosed as having a rare form of muscular dystrophy, and a pathway was laid out in front of me. 
I was told that I would not go to school, I would not get a job, I would struggle to live, I would be dependent on my parents forever. The prognosis written on paper to define who I am. But my experience, I think, is different perhaps than some other people with disabilities because my disclosure is a 300-pound electric wheelchair that goes with me everywhere I go. People don't doubt my status as being disabled in the ways that they doubt others. I noticed in my undergrad the distinct difference between the ways that I was treated by professors, where I asked for accommodation and it was granted often without question, versus those with non-apparent disabilities, those with a mental illness or a learning disability, who were asked to constantly provide an avalanche of doctor's notes, a reliance on the medical gatekeeping to determine the deserving from the undeserving of support and care. It always frustrated me. I always didn't, I never really understood why I was so different. Why did I get through when they would not? Why could accommodation be made for me and not for them? Were the situations really so different? I think we also need to deal with this question of trans institutionalization, or more specifically, the notion that as we move people out of institutions, we have merely taken the rules and logics of the institution and wrapped them around people in the living community. Our image here is an out of focus uh, image with the foreground having a blank, blurred out pile of papers and folders with a black man's face neutrally resting on his tented figure an obstacle yet to be passed or a larger piece of a work to complete, that remains to be seen. But stacks of paper, I think, is a great way of thinking about life with a disability in the trans-institutional world. We live within systems of surveillance, things like the Ontario Disability Supports Program, which requires people to report everything, financial earnings, anything really that they've been doing over the month. We have risks assessments around uh, dating even, in which people who are, uh, if you begin to date somebody, their finances become uh, subject to surveillance as well. We have systems of controls, things like wellness checks, forms and forced institutionalization of those with quote, mental illnesses. More than that though, we have special education, a new institution placed within our schools. When I first started in elementary school, my parents had to fight pretty much every year to keep me out of the special education room, a room that was designed for people who could not really work within the normative mainstream classroom. I was forced into the special education because I required a personal support worker, because I was unable to go to the bathroom myself or to get my books out of my bag or to take my jacket on and put it off. I was required to be associated with special education, to be a student in special ed, something that my parents successfully fought against. If they hadn't, as many parents had not succeeded, I would not have been able to go to university, not because of my capacity, not because of my ability, but because of policy, because of the ways in which we wrote the laws, the rules, because the disabled body must be in its place and its place for a very long time, and still I would argue today, is not in the normative classroom. Having said that, we have made moves toward what we would call mainstreaming. That is, taking disabled people out of the institution, out of special education, and placing them into the quote, mainstream classroom. Our image here is, I think, probably a familiar image of the mainstream classroom. A rows of desks with paper and pencil laid out, in the top row, we have one student in a yellow t-shirt sitting alone, hunched over what is likely a test, elbow on table, hand cupping the back of their head. As we move students out of special education classrooms, we have this evolution of the quote, exceptionality. I was not a disabled student in the classroom. I was an exceptionality, one of those exceptional students. And that could be either students who were either below the line or even those who were above. But in order for me to be able to navigate within the mainstream classroom, rules needed to be changed. And the rule changes were driven by a process called the IEP, or Individual Education Plan. 
These were documents that were formed by doctors, by practitioners, by the teachers, and by parents to try to determine what type of, quote, special treatment would be made for me. Things like extended time to write exams or uh, long breaks if I were to get sick. Access then becomes this sort of added labor in which teachers are now asked to change the world around them to fit in with the student and the needs that have been mapped out. But what I saw as I was sitting in classrooms as a child and all the way up at the university was a bureaucratic paper mache. I was often asking myself, am I confined to a wheelchair? Am I disabled by muscular dystrophy? Or am I confined to a world of paper and documents? This bureaucratic paper mache of forms and documentation, policy and legislation would subjugate me to a life of labor through systems and programs, sometimes successful, sometimes not, in order to have a right to live a life that many are merely born into. Did I become disabled when a doctor wrote MD down on my chart? Or was I born into a paper prison of medical legislation that disables me in its attempt to contain my difference? Am I a student or am I merely the embodiment of the IEP come to life, a round peg jammed into a classroom of square desks? The limits of mainstreaming and the ways in which we use IEPs is what I like to call destructive equality. Destructive equality is when, in an effort to try to normalize and make equality across our student body, we then destroy things, we cancel things. Growing up, it was not uncommon for school trips and other activities to be canceled because they weren't accessible. The idea being, if Jeff can't do it, then no one will. You can probably imagine the type of antagonism or the doubt or blame that might start to lead to. I was also seen, though, as disabling other students. I was unable to go out in the, in the winters at recess. It was too cold. I couldn't navigate the snow. I have a, a very poor immune system. I get sick very easily. So the decision was to keep me inside, to have me uh, inside in the winter. And the decision was, well, let's have a rotating cast of students stay with Jeff and play games in the classroom, meaning that every day, a different student, one at a time, would rotate through. Students asking, why am I not allowed to be out with my friends? Why do I have to stay in and care for this other person, this classmate? It becomes work and not friendship or socialization. It became a way to try to, quote, educate about disability, as opposed to thinking about perhaps my needs, my needs for friendship, my needs for care. Well, there are a lot of problems as I've been working my way through this presentation. I think that there is also hope. As I say on the slide, I think Crip Hope springs eternal, which is timely given that we are finally getting weather that is not awful uh, here in Southwestern Ontario. I think that if we turn to growing work in the world of Crip theory, we can start to see a different path forward a way in which crip knowledge could perhaps make the world a better place. Born out of queer theory then, crip theory is this attempt to stand in resistance to compulsory able-bodiedness, just as queer theory advocates resisting compulsory heterosexuality. It's about asking what happens when the logic of disability becomes the foundation upon everything that is built as opposed to merely retrofitting ableism to try to make disability palpable. So how can crip knowledge make the world a better place? I think it's about moving beyond bricks and mortar, about getting to the core of our pedagogical practice. The image I chose for this slide is a fiery orange and yellow nature scene with a dandelion sending its seeds into the air. If eugenics is the idea of pruning the hereditary tree, of eliminating the brush and the weak limbs, I would argue that crypt theory is about growing a wild mutant forest, sending out our seeds out into the world, planting them wherever we can find soil that will take them, and growing strange, wonderful, and different things, different plants, different structures, 
different ways of being. So what can we learn from disabled people to make our worlds better? What happens if disabled people are placed in charge? I think for most of us, when we think about this move forward, we talk about universal design. We think about this brilliant idea of building a world in which everyone is able to access a truly noble goal. It is about equalizing right to access, not just making spaces that are accessible for just the 70%, somewhere that everyone can participate. But UDI is an imperfect practice. I want to draw your attention to the image on the screen. Uh, this is a photo of Vancouver's Robson Square and its famous or infamous stair ramp hybrid in which a ramp has been built in a zigzag pattern directly into the staircase to serve uh, two purposes at once, both a way of stairs and also a ramp. I use this image intentionally because of both what it promises, an integrated world of walkies and wheelies, but also a lived experience, an imperfect solution that is more form than function. Note the lack of handrails, the grade and duration, the hazard for those with low vision who may trip. This is not actually an accessible design. UDI is difficult because, of course, there is conflicting accessible needs. Much of the story of trying to make the world accessible is the interesting ways in which accessible for some can limit others. One of my favorite stories to tell students in my first year class uh, is the story of the evolution of the sidewalk and the curb cut. When we first encountered uh, sidewalks with wheelchairs, we said, man, oh man, we need a way to get on these sidewalks. And so a group of people in Berkeley, California, under the cover of darkness, went out and they started to chip away at the sidewalks, making curb cuts. It meant that wheelchairs could now access them. But suddenly you had another group of people, people with visual limitations, who said, whoa, 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 we actually need the edge of the sidewalk to know where the street begins and the sidewalk ends. We've since been trying to innovate, having things like rumble strips, which can then be felt by uh, people who are using a walking cane. Those can sometimes have a problem for the small wheels at the front of a manual wheelchair shoot people out into the road, out of their chairs. It's an ever evolving back and forth. As we change one thing, we may make new problems. This doesn't mean though that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work toward, but rather I think it means imagining universally accessible spaces and curriculum a little differently. That rather we need to learn from the core tenant of crypt life, which is that life with a disability is about diversity, and adaptability. The world is inherently inaccessible. The question now is really about how we will adapt and who is expected to do the work. So rather than thinking a little bit about the brick and the mortar, thinking about the really sort of obvious things that we do to try and include people with disabilities from kind of structural ways, I want to think a little bit more philosophically for the remainder of my time, which is rapidly running out. Um, I'm going to draw your eyes to two bits of research happening within the world of disability studies and how these theoretical concepts can, I think, help us to think really differently about the classrooms that we try to build. The first concept is our old friend, Crip Time. I've included this image of Salvador Dali's painting, Melting Watch, uh, which is a surrealist depiction of a pocket watch kind of melting, but also exploding over the corner of a desk, mechanical parts rupturing from its face in ways that can be described as both mechanical or rigid, but also liquid or fluid. I think this is a good way of thinking about experiences of crypt time. Alison Kafer, I think, has written beautifully about crypt time, nodding to Irva Zola and Carol Gill as the progenitors of this idea, even if they didn't coin the term themselves. But crypt time is this idea that those with disabilities have a different experience of time than those without. My time, my world is structured by many other pressures, things like attendant care schedules and paratransit bookings and medical appointments. As Kafer explains, quote, crypt time is flexible time, not just expanded, but exploded. It requires reimagining our notions of what can and should happen in time, 
or recognizing how expectations of, quote, how long things take are based on very particular minds and bodies. When I was in first year in university, I was dependent on paratransit in order to get to and from my residence uh, to school. And for those of you who don't know about paratransit, uh, it's an accessible transit system here in London that requires you to book three days in advance. Uh, and I don't really know why you book three days in advance, because often they will forget you or they will leave you places or they will just be extremely late. To see how bad the system had gotten, I decided to do an experiment in my first year. I decided that I would only attend the class through the powers of paratransit. If paratransit didn't show up, I would not go to class. I wouldn't try and find my own way through the snow. In that one week period, I had 15 hours of class. I made it to two hours of my 15 hours of school. Time missed, not because I was lazy, not because I didn't want to learn, not because I didn't want to be there, but because the system around me to try to get me from point A to point B was simply insufficient, was not designed for the life that a student lives, or really any human, that I would argue. We then started to work on this question of accessible transit at Western, and by third year, we inaugurated this brand new Western Access van. And interestingly enough, my grades went up in third year. They went up even higher in fourth year. I then got into grad school. I then went on to do the PhD. I then was able to teach a class. I never missed a class again, all because the system changed, not me. So what is the value of thinking about crip time? I think that it's about acknowledging the ways in which we all have different needs, demands, and structures, but that disabled people, generally speaking, have a whole lot of time that is taken out of their hands. What can we do about crip time? I think this is where we have to talk about the flexibility of deadlines and due dates within our classrooms. Thinking about how a set due date for everyone perhaps is not actually equitable. I think we need to think about the ways in which, unfortunately, Western just recently canceled the self-reported absence program, a program that aligns with crypt time, that notes that not all limitations are documentable, canceling a program that returns us to medical gatekeeping, where students are now required, once again, to document their inability meaning that some people are going to have more access than others based on their ability to get documentation. What have I done differently in my classrooms? I tried an experiment in one of my third year courses for a couple of years now in which I've allowed students to choose their own due dates. I give them the work, I give them the assignments, and I allow them to become the masters of their own time. I asked myself, is my goal here to ensure that students can comply with orders or is it about trying to teach them about how to become epistemological architects, to build their own pathway through the material, to build knowledge on their own terms. It was a relatively successful experiment. The one caveat being some students found the freedom a little bit too overbearing. So I've modified it, and now I provide them two options. I have a pathway that I've designed, or they can modify it and run it on their own. Managing their time, I think, is not just a worthy skill, but I think it's an equitable approach. I also want to think a little bit about spoon theory, of which you know, playfully I've included a stock image, a white backdrop with different sizes and types of spoons that each have a different dry noodle or pasta shell. Spoon theory uh, was first proposed by Christine Mezzarindino as a metaphor to think about the variant experiences of dexterity and agility. The idea that not everyone has the same amount of spoons in each day, that for some disabled people, we then have to make strategic choices about how to spend our spoon or spend our energy. And these spoons are not actually necessarily self-replenishing or static, that some days are literally and figuratively better than others. Myself in university experienced a lot of sickness. I pretty much got pneumonia every year in my undergrad and master's work, uh, I also got um, uh, shingles, which is apparently a thing you can get when you're 20 years old. Uh, and so that was a problem. 
But what it meant was that I was always behind the ball. I never had the energy that maybe other students did. I would miss big chunks of class because I was in hospital or I was recovering. A simple cold is so much bigger for somebody like me. It's not a three-day recovery. It's a possibly multiple week recovery. This isn't the only way, though, that I have a different access to ability and um, uh, better access to repositories of uh, ability and dexterity. As of right now, I'm also currently suffering from chronic pain. The seat that I'm sitting on right now, this customized wheelchair seat, uh, is old. It is over two years overdue, and I am still waiting for a replacement. What that means is that I am dependent on painkillers. It means that I can only stay sitting up for several hours without taking a break. Uh, it means that I am it's hard to focus often. These are things that are perhaps about the disability, but I think are actually more representative of the system that's been built around me, the system that fails people like me constantly. A system that presents problems outside the classroom that inherently impacts the experiences within. I think then that we need to consider the ways in which non-apparent disability can look really deceiving. People may appear to be, quote, fine, but maybe they are not. We need to consider then the complex time and energy demands that are placed on the modern student and how we can change to fit that need. I had an experience last year uh, with a student who was using a voice to text software to do all of their writing. This was an accessibility concern or a need for them. And they were talking to me about how long it takes for them to write their essays because they have to voice the text, they have to change the errors. It's a constant iterative process. And talking an essay is actually way harder than you would imagine. If you haven't tried it before, I strongly recommend it. I don't think we realize how nice it is to be able to type at our own pace of thought. So in talking to the student, I asked, well, does it have to be an essay? Does it have to be written at all? I decided instead to allow the student to submit a podcast, to change from a written assignment into a spoken assignment that fits within the culture, the idea, the structure of the spoken word, to try to reduce time, to save energy, to put the focus on the outcome. And sure enough, the outcome was beautiful. It was a wonderful podcast about the topics of the class. Again, showing me what they had learned as opposed to structuring themselves within the world that I wanted them to find themselves within. I leave us then today with an image from a wonderful children's book uh, done by Canadians called We Move Together. Uh, their website is at the bottom, wemovetogether.ca if you would like to buy it. And I love this image from the children's book, uh, which has the gathering of disability activists and allies, wheelchairs and walkers and crutches and animals and instruments, smiling, cheering, holding signs like we're in this together, nothing about us without us. Access is love. When I see this image, what I see is the thing that I missed through my education. I see a story of disability, a culture, a community of disability. I see a reimagining of what we think is normal. I think we need to let go of the concept of the normal student. Let go of structured classrooms for the 70% and start to imagine what happens when we change that structure to embrace the 20%, those who are regularly left behind, those who can't fit in, not because of internal or biological difference or problems, but because we've built a world that does not expect them that does not perhaps want them. We need to realize that these changes are happening, happening rapidly. I was one of the first integrated students who went through my elementary school, and I am not that old. We are seeing more and more disability arrive at the university, not because we have become a society of fragile people, but rather because mainstreaming accessibility laws of AODA are working and more disabled students are making it to the place that they were told they would not belong. When I first applied to university, I was told not to tell Western, 
that I had a disability. I was told that they wouldn't allow me to come to the school, that they wouldn't want a disabled person there. It was a place of higher learning for the elite. I did tell them, and I'm glad I did, because Western really opened their arms to me. They said, let's find a way to make this work. And it did. I made it through. I survived. But that is only one story. That is only one success. What I want to leave us with today is to think about how we can help not just one person, not just those who appear to be disabled, but how we can structurally change our classrooms to embrace different ways of being, living, doing, and existing. To collapse the normal, we need to realize that normalcy never really existed. And that's actually kind of freeing. So good luck. Thank you. And hopefully I've left a little bit of time for questions. Fingers crossed. Jeff, you know how sometimes there are talks or experiences that fundamentally change who you are and how you see the world? Um, I need to tell you that this was that talk, that experience for me, and I don't think I am alone in, in that. I'm hearing, I'm seeing lots of comments uh, come up in, in the chat, um, agreeing with that sentiment. I actually feel any comment that I might make at this point just feels insufficient. <laughs> um, but I'm looking forward to, to our conversation and, and the questions that, that folks are, are going to raise to you. I really Thank appreciated. I really appreciated that you started with that history and that context setting. Um, sometimes people ask, "Why are we doing that?" Right? That's not important. But are as as you said, our past and forums are present. And as you were walking us through some of those historical moments, I could see echoes in our classrooms, in our university structures or policies of why we do things now the way that we do. Um, and it really highlighted for me the inadequacy of the concept of accommodation and everything that's wrong with it and everything that we're trying to move away from. So I'm waiting for, for folks to post questions in, in the chat. So I will raise those um, to, to Jeff. Um, one question I was thinking about was around your comments around universal design. And as that terminology gains speed, not just at Western, but at higher institution, higher education institutions around the country, do you have cautions for us? Yeah. And how yeah, might you speak sure. differently? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love to. Uh, I have many ideas, many complaints. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think my, my biggest caution um, is we have this really bad habit of thinking about accessibility and accommodation uh, as being something that is structural in nature. Uh, and so we're like, well, we need to build a policy and then the policy will lead us to these sort of high best practices. And we have this sort of idea that accessibility is this kind of math formula where if we just punch in the right integers, we get accessibility out the other side. Uh, and I like to think about accessibility a little bit more like Lego. Um, so I don't know if any of you played with Lego uh, as, as a child, but I, I loved Lego. I was not great at building things, but I love Lego. And I was the type of kid who didn't follow the instructions. Like I didn't, I didn't take the rules and then follow the whatever. I was like, I got a bunch of parts and I'm going to cobble it together into some monstrosity. Uh, and I think that when we think a little bit about accessibility and universal design, we have to think a little bit like Lego, which is you're sort of cobbling pieces together. You're putting things together, trying to make a final project of what it might look like with the idea that sometimes you've got to pull a piece off, reconstruct it and put it back on as something completely different. Uh, I think universal design, true universal design is about thinking, how can we increase flexibility and diverse multimodal access uh, in everything that we're doing? So rather than charting one pathway for a student to get from week one to week 13, how can we have multiple off-ramps for different students to be able to take those off-ramps based on their own needs and competencies and abilities? 
uh, I think that's getting us a little bit closer to uh, to what this might look like. Um, so yes, there are some really important things like the tangible, like we should be making sure that our readings are accessible to screen readers. Yes, we should be making sure our learning systems, our LMSs are accessible to screen readers. Yes, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes into the idea that um, disability is multiple and plural and strange and diverse in ways that can't really be tracked. Uh, and so to steal a phrase from the autistic community, uh, if you've met one person with autism, uh, you've met one person with autism. Uh, I think the same could be said of really every disability. Uh, go into every instance as though you've got a box of a bunch of Lego and you're going to build something new and beautiful. Uh, and there isn't a rule book, but there are people that want to build with you. Uh, that'll help you to do that work, not just within the world of education, but students. I think empowering students to become builders themselves resolves some of these problems. Acknowledging that students are valid, important holders of knowledge, not just in terms of how to access things, but knowledge holders and researchers themselves. That power dynamic shift, I think, helps to unpack uh, ableism and, and eugenic disciplines that we impose on students every day. I think that comment about working with students is so powerful um, and yet we don't do enough of it right collectively so i'm hearing so many things and and, and some of this echoes uh some previous themes of perspectives too and I, I don't say this in in any way to try to conflate these different things um but i've heard so much about flexibility um multiplicity choice autonomy um and how important uh these elements are in, in the classroom, in, in our pedagogy. There's lots of questions coming in, um, lots of great questions. I wanna start with one that Jennifer has posted in the chat. Um, and Jennifer is touching on something, uh, a conversation I think that has been coming up a lot at Western. Uh, she's saying, I suspect that we need ways to change how we decide who to admit to the university. Right at mm -hmm. the gate. The literal and the metaphoric gate. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. What are your thoughts I, I, about what we could do there? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think, uh, on the one hand, the people that were the, the most down on me going to university were not universities themselves. Uh, it was the general public. Uh, it was random people in my life who were telling me the university is never going to allow you. This is not going to happen. It's not going to end well. Um, there are a lot of people that hear that same story, and uh, it, it just isn't the reality. Um, it just isn't. I mean, there are some institutions that aren't as ascended as Western, uh, <laughs> I would say. But uh, by and large, I think universities do want to become more accessible. I think they do want to make things work. They might not know how, and they might have a lot of trouble doing it, and they might get in their own way a lot of the time. Um, but I think combating this idea that disabled people are not welcome at university is a big first step. I think we also need to remember that uh, the wave is coming, a change is coming one way or another, because people like me are getting PhDs, and people like me are getting hired as professors, and people like me will then eventually become administrators, and people like me will then... and fix the university. Um, so if not, and, and we'll fix all the problems for you. Uh, it's just <laughs> a little bit snide, perhaps. But uh, but I think the change is coming. And we have to see that we've moved a, a very long way forward in the last decade. Um, it is hard to imagine where we're at now in the university back in the 1980s. It's a different world. And what you're saying now is touching on some of the questions that, that we're getting, and they touch on that sort of tension between what we desire to do in, in classrooms versus the structures that, that we find ourselves in. Um, so some of the, the context that, that folks are presenting, uh, larger classes, increased demands for, for time. Um, what do we do with that on the one hand? Um, and how that impacts our ability to be supportive in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think my, my simple answer to this is solidarity. 
um, that I think as, as a professorate, we need to understand, uh, you know, especially in a union term of, of solidarity, uh, we need to be in solidarity with disabled students um, in the same way that uh, I think that there is some really productive ways in which students can also be in solidarity with us. Uh, we have to remember that we are the majority of the institution without the students, without the professors, without the staff, without the librarians, uh, these institutions would be nothing. They wouldn't exist. Uh, we have power in these structures, but it means that we need to think a little bit about the ways in which we want to try to move forward and how, if we focus very narrowly on our own conditions, if we focus exclusively on our own conditions of labor, I think we are upholding ableism. We're then upholding some of these structures because we're trying to get a good deal for ourselves. And I think Encrypt Future is a world in which we fight together for a better world for all of us, uh, in which we don't think about just how can we get a good deal for professors, and we think about how can we get a good deal that lets professors do the amazing things that we want to do and can do within the classroom. Uh, that means thinking differently about the ways in which we deliver university education. I think that means thinking a little bit differently about the ways that we support university education. And I think that only happens through solidarity. Uh, we're in this together um, because if we're not, if we're working to ourselves, uh, then we're just ensuring that our hierarchy continues. And to me, that's ableism. I'm so glad you mentioned solidarity as an approach, as a path forward. Um, and when you said solidarity, you, you started by talking about solidarity with students, but I was also thinking solidarity with, with each other, right? And all of us together can amplify voices as, as pathways forward. Yeah, I think working together, collaborating is a radical act in a world of ableism, in a world of individualism that says that one person should be doing it all. My life is not a singular life. Um, without my attendant care, I don't bathroom, I don't shower, I don't get dressed, I don't eat. Uh, without my medical team, uh, I would have been dead many times over uh, over the last few years. Without my partner, Clara, uh, I wouldn't live independently. Without um, my service dog, uh, I wouldn't be able to pick things up off the ground. Disability lives are lives that are enmeshed in society, enmeshed in community, uh, enmeshed in working together, not just receiving care, but giving care too. I think if we can take that nugget and bring it out into our own world, into our own lives and say, how can we work together with people? How can we raise each other up? I think that's a better world at the other side. It's really interesting because Jesse Stamel yesterday was also talking about, he didn't say solidarity, um, but he was talking about relationality as, mm -hmm. as a radical act in, in the academy. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hearing some, some echoes there as well. In the chat, some people are, are curious, I think, about ways that you bring this into your, into your classroom through, through various ways. So for example, what does the course syllabus look like? So when we talk about flexibility and embedding that into our daily practices and into the structures of the course, um, how do you do that in terms of the syllabus, even when it comes yeah. to assignment deadlines? Yeah, a great, a great question. Uh, I, I, I've talked to, uh, speaking with a colleague of mine, Dr. Christian, uh, over, at, uh, over at King's, uh, I'm embarking on a fever dream of syllabus reimagination this summer, uh, which uh, I will, who knows how that's gonna go. Um, because the sense I'm getting is that the traditional syllabus, the syllabus as we perhaps did it ourselves as we were entering into undergrad and into grad school, um, is not connecting with students in the same way. Uh, I think it's really easy for us to, you know, sort of basically be like, oh, read the syllabus. They don't read this. The students don't read the syllabus anymore. Um, I don't think it's that they don't read the syllabus. I think it's that they don't perceive the syllabus in the ways that we do. And that means that we need to think differently about the syllabus. Uh, we need to think about how we've moved away from this world of training manuals and moved more to a, a world of how-to videos, uh, for instance. Uh, and so I think when I think about my syllabus this summer and I think about how I'm going to be restructuring it and redesigning it, 
I think part of it is that we need to pull the curtain back a little bit and show the students uh, the all-powerful Oz that's pulling the strings in the background to better and more clearly explain why we're doing the things that we're doing. Why is it organized this way? Why is this the pathway that we've drawn forward? Not because it's the only way, but it's because it's the way that our brain has built this information. Um, this is something I've been starting to do a lot more as well in terms of assignment sheets, is I will produce assignment sheet because it will work for me. It's the way that I would understand an assignment. But I also understand as a media studies scholar that communication is inherently flawed. And so uh, I always invite my students to come and talk to me about the assignment sheet. Let's actually go through it to ask questions where you could say, what does this mean? Is that important? No, it's not. Okay, it's just Jeff babbling on as he loves to do. Um, I've been building those sort of interactions and, and, and providing multiple ways of coming at things, uh, whether it be audio, whether it be written, whether it be video, whether it be image, uh, I think is the types of work we need to start doing to try to enhance them multiple ways through uh, basically what is a, a, a set of work instructions. I love that. And that's also making, um, again, that idea of that hidden curriculum, making explicit um, why we've structured things the way that, yeah. that we have and, and what some of the other choices are. Yeah, I think it shows a vulnerability, right? I think, and I think that's really important. Uh, I think it's okay to say to students, look, like, I've done this for a long time. I've done a lot of reading. I am a so-called expert um, because, well, I'm not according to everyone on the internet, but some people think that I'm an expert. Um, but I'm also fallible. I'm human. I'm a flawed person. Uh, and so I've cobbled things together in the way that I think is best. But there are other pathways through this. And, uh, and if students see it a different way or a better way, um, let's have that conversation. Let's think a little bit about what that might look like. Um, yeah. Uh, there's there's questions that are specific to certain things that people have seen in the classroom. Uh, so one question is asking around accommodations, uh, and I wonder if we can if we can think about this in terms of uh, beyond accommodations and, and more about structural changes even that we can make um, for students who have had um, trouble reading and writing in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the things that I've been that I, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, multimodal uh, multimodal design and, and multiple access points for information. And one thing that we did in our first year class, Dr. Christian and I uh, in in DS ten ten exploring disability, which is our introduction class essentially in disability studies. Uh, was, we decided that we we were not going to uh, do death by Zoom uh, for our students. We weren't going to bring them in and then have us talk at them for three hours. Uh, nobody wants that. I mean, we're not Netflix. I'm not that entertaining. Uh, and so that's not going to happen. You actually are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I don't know. I get like pretty boring after you uh, have seen a song and dance for more than an hour. Uh, but what we decided to do instead was uh, that we would produce sort of multiple ways for our information. So we, we had sort of more traditional readings, which were assigned for students to read. We then also wrote sort of blog style um, pathways through the material. And then we also recorded podcasts of Dr. Christian and I talking about the material. So essentially there were like three different spaces in which you could access the information. So if you were more of a, of a listener, you had access to that through the podcast. If you were a reader, you had access to that through sort of more academic text. If you really struggle with academic readings and you want to play a little bit more sort of poppy, um, then you had that way through the material. Material. And then what we did instead was using our Zooms as meeting points and discussion points, uh, the bringing students together, getting them out into breakout rooms, and using that time as being productive conversation periods, times for us to actually work through the ideas, ask questions, propose questions, and start to think a little bit about solutions to some of the problems that we're trying to address in the class, uh, giving people another way to try to learn, to learn through discussion. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a part of it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll end, I think, with, with one other really interesting example where I had a student who really struggled with writing, um, and they struggled with writing because uh, they, uh, they had psychosis. Uh, and with their uh, experience of psychosis, they had a really hard time sort of organizing their thoughts, but they thought more sort of pictographically, more sort of through image. Uh, and so what they did for their final paper, as opposed to writing a paper, is uh, they created this collage. Uh, and it was this giant, unbelievable thing 
Um, and they walked me through it and they explained the ways that they're seeing the images and seeing the content and working their way through this pathway, which meant that I had to figure out how do you mark this in comparison to an essay, which a lot of people would say, I don't know how to do that, uh, which is completely fair. My philosophy was, well, what am I trying to do with this assignment? What I'm trying to do is, do you understand the concept? Are you able to apply it? Are you able to show um, sort of a deeper level understanding of it? Can you apply it into a real world scenario? And those are all things that you are able to do, whether you're doing it as a, a giant collage or as a paper or as a podcast. So it meant thinking differently about the ways that I evaluate and saying, you know what? I'm not gonna be taking marks off if you have a typo in your paper because uh, there are typos on my slides. There are typos in my lessons. Uh, I don't think I've ever written an essay without or an email without typos in it. Uh, and so I'm more interested in, in the, the core ideas because um, I get around in a wheelchair. I don't walk. I think both of those methods of getting to the destination are devoid of value, uh, whether you walk to the street or whether you roll on the street. It's where you end up at the end that really matters, I think. And that's really had to change the way that I think about evaluation. Uh, but I think that's also helped, allowed for more flexibility. I love that, right? Because it's so important thinking about the outcomes and the goal. What are we seeking to assess um, mm -hmm. and focusing on that? And I love multimodal in terms of not just how we convey informa information, but also how we allow students to represent that information. Yeah. I could stay here for the rest of the afternoon, um, but I want to take a moment and, act, and thank you for this outstanding presentation. I'm so glad I have a recording because I'm going to need it because I'm going to be referring to this for a long time.